There are a lot of ways in which the Buddha compares the activities of the mind to fire. Greed, aversion, delusion. These are fires that burn away in the mind. And as we chanted just now, they set fire to our eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, mind, to the things we know through the senses. It's almost as if our minds are like flamethrowers, setting fire to everything that we fasten on. Then the Buddha compares the mind and concentration to a fire, but it's a different kind of fire. You say the fires of greed, aversion, delusion are like flames of a bonfire. They flicker here, flicker there. They're so unstable, so erratic, that you can't really read by them. And they create all sorts of weird shadows, lots of false impressions. But if you can turn down the flame, think of turning down the flame on a gas stove until the flame is steady. That's the fire of the mind in concentration. So even though the mind is still burning, it's burning in a way that it gives rise to a fire that you can read by. In Pali they have different verbs for burning. And the verb they use for the flame of an oil lamp is jayati. And the burning is jhana, which is the name for right concentration. So you're trying to get the mind to calm down so you can read by it, see what's actually going on. So try to steady the flames of your mind right now. Here it's good to know the Buddha's analysis for what happens as a fire burns. There's a fire potential. And when you set fire to something, you're actually getting that potential to latch on to the fuel. So here we're latching on to the breath. And you want to stay there. You want to hold on really tight. Not all of meditation is about letting go. There's a large part that requires development. So here we're developing a steady flame. Now eventually you want this steady flame to fill the whole body. And John Lee notes, however, though, that some people find it hard to deal with the whole body all at once. So he recommends that they start with one small spot and protect that spot. It's almost as if you're trying to light a fire in the wind. You have to protect the flame. So find any spot in the body that's especially sensitive to how the breathing feels. It might be in the middle of the chest, in the stomach, in the middle of the head. Focus there, because those really sensitive spots in the body, the ones that are really sensitive in the breath, tend to connect up with other parts of the body as well. You can think of them as the crossroads in this network of breath channels of the body. And if you keep the crossroads open, traffic flows well. And gradually from those crossroads you begin to see this is where the network of roads extends, how it extends through your body. Each person's experience of the body is going to be different. So you have to explore what you've got, but try to make your focus as steady as possible, because only then can you read the mind. Particularly you want to see what its other attachments are. When the mind leaves the object of concentration, where does it go and why? How does it go? Sometimes it will make a decision in a secret part of the mind. Not so secret that you can't detect it, it's there, but 
The mind has this tendency to make these decisions and then pretend that it didn't. It's like a dog we used to have in the monastery in Thailand in the evening when the monks would get together. For their evening allowables, the dog would come and want some. And if you didn't pay any attention to it, it would scratch your leg. And if you looked down on it, it would look away as if it hadn't done anything. That's where the mind is with itself. It'll do something and then pretend that it didn't do it. And what we're trying to do as we meditate is to see these areas in the mind that are hidden. Some of them are simply things you don't know. Other things are things that you willfully ignore. So it's not simply a matter of exploring unexplored territory where you've never been before. Some of these places you've been many, many times, but you choose to cover them up. We talk about the subconscious as if it were some area in the mind where the doors are closed. But it's actually the quick decisions made by the mind that are sometimes so quick you barely notice them. And then you cover them up. So as we meditate, we're trying to create a sense of well-being in the mind so that you're willing to look at this habit that the mind has of lying to itself. When we're in a bad mood, when we're feeling oppressed by things outside, we're just generally worn out. We don't want to see this habit. We try to pretend that it's not there, and we resent being told that it is there. Of course, that means we resist looking at it ourselves. But when you can create a sense of well-being in the mind, a sense of confidence that you've got a good space here in the mind, a safe space in the mind where you can begin to open up about things that are going on in there. then you're more likely to see. So work on maintaining this steady flame. Because this is the flame by which you can read things. As I said, it still has its attachments. And one of the last attachments we're going to let go of is this steady flame. But before you let it go, get a lot of use out of it. There's so many interesting things you can see in the mind if you look inside. All this, of course, is based on the assumption that you do have freedom of choice. And the choices made exclusively within the mind have power. This is why we meditate. The question sometimes comes up about different teachings that the Buddha gives that are hard to prove right away. Things like rebirth and karma. But you have to realize there's so many things that we simply assume in life so that we can function. And some people say, well, what does rebirth have to do with me? And I simply don't know, and I'll leave it as I don't know. But every time you act, you're making certain assumptions. The fact that you're sitting here meditating shows that you have some belief, at least, that the training of the mind is important and it will have an impact on the world, impact on your life. And that's quite an assumption right there. But if we couldn't assume it, it would be very depressing. Everything would be totally beyond our control. A while back I was reading about a psychologist from the early 20th century who was studying infants. And he discovered that one of the things that makes infants most happy is doing something and getting a result, and then doing it again, getting the same result, doing it again, getting the same result. You probably notice that sometimes they'll make a noise 
and do it again, and another noise, another noise, another noise. It can drive you crazy. But for them it's an assertion of their agency, that they are able to make a choice and get a certain result that they can depend on. Now the sense of agency is something they're assuming, but it is what allows for happiness. So in the same way, the Buddha asks us to make certain assumptions that have to do with the choices we make in life. Because when you choose to do something, especially something that's going to take time, like meditation, it's going to require effort and dedication and sacrifice. You have to calculate that it's worth it. And the question is, what goes into that calculation? What kind of results do you expect? And as he says, it's good to be open to the idea that the results of your actions can lead to states of being not only in this lifetime, but in future lifetimes. Because when that enters into the calculation, you tend to be more skillful in your decisions, you tend to be more responsible. As you see, as you assume it, there's nothing you're going to get away with. So you might as well do things as skillfully as you can. That, he says, is a good pragmatic reason for at least taking on rebirth and the teachings on karma as working hypotheses. He's not asking you to swear up and down that, yes, you believe this 100%, because he knows you can't believe it 100% until you've had proof inside. And the proof comes with the first glimpse of awakening, as you step outside of space and time. And as stepping out of time, you begin to realize you've been through a lot longer time than just the time since the date of your birth in this lifetime. Which is why stream entry, the arising of the Dharma eye, is the point where your conviction in these working hypotheses is confirmed. The Buddha doesn't ask us to believe in a lot. As he said, the things that he taught were like the handful of leaves, as compared to the leaves in the forest. The leaves in the forest were all the things he came to know in the course of his awakening. But he said a lot of those things would be totally useless in the task of putting an end to suffering. He taught what was only absolutely necessary. And he saw this part of the that handful, this leaf of karma, this leaf of rebirth, as necessary. So give him the benefit of the doubt. Maybe he knew something that you don't know. Everybody takes that passage in the Kalama Sutta as free as the Buddha's permission to just believe anything you want that you like. But that's not what he said. You have to test things. You have to take into consideration the teachings of the wise. And even then, this is a teaching he gave to people who had yet, not yet committed themselves. Once you've committed yourself to the practice, he says, one of the assumptions you make is, the Buddha knows, I don't know. Take that on as a working hypothesis and see where it leads you. It leads you to something bigger than you already are at the moment. Because the Dharma is large. And a lot of our presuppositions are based on ignorance. So it might be good to uh, try a few assumptions that come from somebody who has found awakening. And it seems likely that he was awakened. Give him a try. If your mind is too closed to give him a try, you're closing off a lot of possibilities. There's the whole issue of the possibility of awakening. That, too, is an assumption. And as he says, if you assume that it's not possible, that closes off the door. 
and you're closing it off based on what? Well, you don't really know. So why make things impossible for yourself on the basis of ignorance? Again, give the Buddha the benefit of the doubt. You've already given him this much the benefit of the doubt, the fact that you're sitting here meditating, trying to steady this flame of your mind. to try to be more generous in your attitude towards other teachings. Try them on and see how far they make it grow.